I have to start this by confessing that I've known about Lore Wolf for a while and that I just haven't covered it because I've been focused on so many other things. I first learned about Lore Wolf, which is a wolf sim RPG that is going to Kickstarter soon. It had its alpha back in October and I was invited to join, but I was in the process of literally moving into this house and I wasn't really making videos at that point. So I passed on that opportunity. But now that the Kickstarter is coming up, I thought now would be a good time to talk about it. Also, I've received comments on my channel that you guys are really interested in learning more about like the landscape of virtual pet games and just the new games coming out and like smaller games. So let's today discuss the context of Lore Wolf, the content that's been released, like the alpha and how people responded to it my reaction to the Kickstarter, and my takeaway on green flags through red flags about this game. Let's start with the introductory email Alanis sent when they were trying to pitch the game to me and trying to get me to make a video and join the alpha. Lorewolf is a wolf-themed pet game that will feature a comprehensive breeding system, customizable looks, exciting battles, competitive minigames, and a world full of locations and rich histories to explore. The game is part pet sim, in that players will be able to assign an alpha wolf that they will experience the world through, but also an inventory management and pet collection game akin to Neopets or Flight Rising. What it immediately made me think of was Lyodin, because in Lyodin you assign an alpha and then you play the game through the experience of that lion. But when I went to the Discord and I asked what people liked about it, one of the market things that people responded with is that it's much more of a casual play than Lyodin or Wolvedin is because Wolvedin has character death and also very stringent demands. Like it's a very demanding game to play. At least Lyodin is. I haven't tried Wolvedin yet, but Lyodin is a very demanding game to play. The most common comparison that I'm seeing is comparing Lore Wolf to Flight Rising, which is promising because Flight Rising, as you guys may know, is like my favorite game. I play it like every day if I can. Like if I'm online recreationally, I play Flight Rising because Flight Rising is very enjoyable. And what I saw on the Discord from asking around is comparisons directly to Flight Rising as far as the daily requirements are considered. But that being said, it has more to do than Flight Rising because of the narrative and the plot. If we go to the Lore Wolf homepage today, you'll see that it's got a Kickstarter information, a huge banner, and we'll talk a little bit more about the Kickstarter later. We also have a link to the Discord. I was asking people questions there earlier. It's very active. And then you can see the demo. You got a couple of different body types, and then you've got some colors. And there is a limited color wheel, but that is part of the Kickstarter. And then you can just like kind of make the sparkle doggy of your dreams. The art style kind of reminds me of Novelar. It is right between Novelar and Flight Rising, with Flight Rising having thinner line work, harsher shadows, and Novelar being less complex and having more soft feathered shading. I enjoy this. I think it's very cute. It's very marketable. I think a lot of people can look at this and say, oh wow, that's perfect for me to build my original character. Like, because you can add so many markings. It's, it's, a, it's a cute base. I like the line art. I received permission from YouTube user Kersek to include their footage from the alpha and from the footage we can just see what the interface looks like and how the interactions work on the site. They ran through a lot of their play sessions so all of like the different features on the site you could go and view from Kersak's YouTube channel but what we basically see here is them creating their alpha and then creating the mate for their alpha and breeding them and what that process looks like. I like the way that the site, the site is laid out. It's definitely polished, right? Instead of going the way of Neopets, where Neopets is let's, let's make it more toony, more palatable for children. It's more in the direction of Flight Rising, where it's like, let's make this look polished and sophisticated and 
the interactions look like they work well. I appreciate what I'm seeing here so far, but then again, I'm not, you know, I'm not really seeing very much. I appreciate Karasek publishing this so that we are able to see what the features look like. And it looks like if you back the Kickstarter, you will be backing a game that has been developed. Like, this game is a game. It's not like day one you won't be able to play anything. Because there is a game there and it is functional. Something that I really enjoyed is that there is a capture of going through the process of finding a stud and buying studding rights from a from a critter and that is an innovation we don't see that on flight rising it would be nice to see and so that's I, I liked that I enjoyed that I wish that was a feature on flight rising but let's go over some of the Kickstarter tiers the rewards at five dollars you get access to the beta test and then you get the companion they are expiring, or excuse me, retiring content after the alpha and then after the beta. So it's one of those scenarios where it's like, if you don't have the money or the knowledge about the thing, it's going to go away and you'll never be able to get it. So I, I always find that a little frustrating, but it's up to the game developer, whatever kind of game they want to make, and they want to make the kind of game where stuff retires. So you will get... The beta package at five dollars then at ten dollars you get some decor and then a different companion at twenty dollars you get to pick like which pack of content you want and the different packs are the dark spine the murkwood the gold sea and the ice run and then uh at thirty dollars you get the exclusive breed the Brockus breed at $50, you get early access to the beta two days before anybody else, and only 50 of these will be sold. Then uh, uh, on the $60 level, you get Allied, which you get all four of the different packs content. And most likely this is the level that I would support at if I'm going to support, I haven't decided yet. I guess, I mean, most likely I'm going to support and at $60. Then $80, you get a bunch of companions. $100, you get all kinds of stuff. You get all the companions, you get early access, you get all of the packs, and then you, you just get everything. $150, you get to design an item, and then you get 10 copies of the item. $200, you get com companion designer, where you get to design a companion and you get 10 copies of it. $250 is apparel. Those are the different tiers that they're offering. Now that we've broken down the Kickstarter tiers and rewards, let's go through the Kickstarter video and then we'll talk a little bit about the game development process and the things that I see going on with the site. To start off, we see a title card that says Bashful Games, which I believe is the company that was founded to publish this game. Then we get a little cinematic shot with mountains and the logo. I would like to say that the logo is very much in line with what we would expect for a virtual pet game launching in 2021. It looks very nice. We could see the four symbols of the different packs. If I were to simplify this, I would just take off those symbols. It's not exactly a marketing angle to have different alliances. Then we see the different clip art or just the character art for pets, for your pets, and maybe some NPCs teasing the fact that this content has already been developed. Next up, we get a rundown of what kind of features that this game has. It's got breeding, customization, uh, battles, and role-playing game elements. So what that says to me is that we're gonna see genetics. Hopefully that means the colors passed down and the markings passed down in an interesting way for the pets that you could then dress them up, that you could play against the environment, you could play against different players, and that there is a storyline. So these are the unique attributes of this game. We'll see a little bit of them in the rest of the video. Next up, we get a preview of what the wolf creator looks like. This is also live on the Lore Wolf homepage if you just wanna play with it. There are three body types, so like three different genetic makeups that you could really tap into here. You've got the Lupin, which is like a wolf. You got the Jockle, which is like a jackal, or I guess maybe a coyote. And then you've got the kit, which is like a fox. As you're watching this, or if you go to the pet creator yourself, you could see that there are basically three different color slots. 
and three marking slots as well and you can kind of play with how they overlap and what they look like. Basically it's primary, secondary, and tertiary coloring. Next we get a preview of the pet lookup, the pet page itself. It's got the description details, the bloodline details, it's pet or companion which you can interact with I believe multiple times a day. The setup is similar to Flight Rising or Neopets in the sense that you can assign a pet to your pet and interact with it, but I believe that unlike Flight Rising it isn't a once a day thing. They don't really touch on it in the video. What they go through in the video is they show you the pet page and they show you dressing up the pet. The next thing they show in the video is the world map, which looks like, unfortunately, a lot like the Flight Rising map. And I know that's not intentional. There's just so many iterations of like the same thing that you can do. It's definitely reminiscent of it. I mean, there's only so much you could do when each pack is associated with a different biome and you want those biomes to be connected for the sake of lore. Next up, we get an example of what battling or explore looks like. This is player versus environment. So they are fighting an NPC and they don't explain this in the video, but this is an automated battling system. So you don't have to like control each one individually like a Pokemon or the way that you battle on Plate Rising. This should theoretically go faster. Next up, we get a cute little animation from questing, which apparently you access by accessing NPCs from the different explorer options. Then there is the pageant, a weekly beauty contest. Doesn't really speak to me. We also see a sample of what player versus player looks like, which is similar to that format from Explorer where you're battling that's automated. Then we also see that the forums work. And for me, being like, hi, our forums work, isn't really like a marketing ploy. Like, thank God your forums work, it's 2021. There's no excuse for the forums to not work. Now is the part of the video where they get into a little bit more of the businessy stuff, which I very much appreciate. They have a roadmap of launch, how, when it's going to happen, what's going on between now and then. They want to add some finishing touches, which include additional breeds, patterns, more mini games, and a finished storyline for the RPG. And then they break down where all the money is going. Here we see an interesting angle where I feel like the goal amount, $3,000, is kind of like a marketing element because I do believe they are going to hit this goal. And this goal of $3,000 covers keeping the lights on. It covers getting it started, getting it ramped up. And then they have these stretch goals, which are also at completely reasonable funding levels. And the stretch goals, I feel like, are things that they were already planning to do that should already be on the roadmap of this game. They are add a new species, add more colors, release a new mini game, stuff like that. It was like, guys, you are already planning on doing this. Then the video concludes with a happy doggy in front of the mountain saying thank you. Very cute. I liked it. Good. Good Kickstarter video. I've seen a lot of Kickstarter videos in my day and that was a pretty good one. You guys should watch it if you haven't seen it yet. The narrator's voice feels very Midwestern and comfortable. It makes me feel right at home. I love it. You know what? Because we're already here and I work on YouTube, let's just go through a couple of my pet peeves when it comes to YouTube channels managed by companies. And this is pretty universal. Lorewolf isn't alone on these things. If we go to their page and then we're like, I don't know, let's 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 pull up Dapper Volks page. Oh, look at that. They don't even index for their own game. Okay. If we see a lot of the same stuff going on here, or let's see, let's go to Flight Rising. It's just not optimized in any way. And so Lorewolf, you're just the convenient one that was in front of me when I was recording. So you're the one who gets to experience this criticism. This video, great thumbnail. Beautiful thumbnail. I mean, it could be a little bit better. It could, like, the logo could be bigger because it's pretty small, but, like, pretty good upload. The description, though, is super short. It, it doesn't have enough keywords. You should have more keywords. And speaking of keywords, you don't have any tags. You should have some tags, and the tags should reflect the description. And then, the title should reflect some of those, but I get it. If you're not planning on like running a YouTube channel, you're not going to do these things. 
it just if they feel like really easy things to me to just add some hashtags in and I, I just have vidIQ basic for for looking at YouTube because like I said it's part of my job what I'm logged into isn't my professional vidIQ though this is for my YouTube channel this is my separate membership that I pay for for myself so don't worry boss man if you're watching my boss man's not watching all right so if you go to the home page there, there's only one playlist. This is the default of how YouTube is set up. That's why Fly Rising does this too. And if we like just go to my channel real quick, you see that there's like all this stuff right here and it's not hard to do. You just press this customize channel button and then you just like add more playlists. And I know what you're thinking, Lore Wolf. You're thinking, I only have one playlist. Uh, it kind of looks like you have multiple playlists. You've got gameplay you've got speed paint and then i know there are videos of people doing the alpha why don't you have a playlist of the alpha by the way ooh, that logo is so good look at that circle logo that is so good anyways i don't understand why why it's not optimized it's just a pet peeve of mine i hate you hate to see this you should have the kickstarter intro video as the channel trailer for people who haven't subscribed because you have 52 subscribers most of the internet hasn't subscribed to you yet Ugh. that is my rant that is my pet peeve here we have the lore wolf development timeline in phase one they were gearing up for their alpha where they were developing assets phase two was the alpha test that was in october and they were able to test all of their features and get feedback, kind of get their rough draft functional so that it's an enjoyable process to play the game. Mentioned previously, the YouTube user Carsec gave me permission to use their video from this alpha. So because there was an alpha before the Kickstarter, we're able to see that the game is functional, it does work, and according to the users who participated in the alpha, the developer, Jim Jim, was very responsive to updating the site on the fly in response to player feedback. Phase 3 is the Kickstarter, which will launch on March 1st. After March 1st, the remaining phases are beta testing, which will start to be announced. They don't have a projected date yet, and the beta codes will be sent through email. Then there will be beta early access, which is a tier that you could purchase through the Kickstarter, the beta test launch, and then testing. So beta itself is testing and what we could expect to see with the beta, I'm just gonna say it now because people always seem surprised, is that at the end of the beta test, because it is a testing environment, all the progress that users completed will probably be purged and everything will be reset for launch. So game launch is phase five and that is to be announced as well. I would really like to see at least years associated with this because, you know, if, if the launch won't be until like 2023, that would be a nice thing to see. And, or maybe even like quarters, like quarter one, 2022, you know, it just, it's a nice thing to see at like a, a anticipated date. And you should always say that it's going to take longer than it will, because that way, if you move up a date, people see it as like a huge success. Like that's just a little bit of marketing is that you say it's going to take longer than it's going to, so that you come in under time, under budget. I mean, that's just a little bit of show and dance. You don't have to do that. The way that this is laid out is fine, but people feel good when stuff is done like under budget, ahead of time. It, it makes you look good. And if you have a realistic deadline, it'll look good for you to deliver it on time. But if you're a first time game developer, you won't really know like what a realistic deadline is. So these are all challenges that first time developers face. This is run of the mill stuff. I feel like the elephant in the room is that the last video I published was about a kickstarted game that under delivered what the backers expected. So I kind of got to compare the two, why Lorewolf would be any sort of project that you would want to defend or look at or support. So I've kind of categorized the different signals from green to red as a green flag or a red flag. A green flag meaning go ahead, kind of like a green light. A yellow light being caution, 
proceed with caution. <laughs> and then the red light or the red flag being, ah, uh, maybe we should be concerned. But the concern is up to you guys. And I'm just kind of raising these things as like, these are considerations. What I think to be an obvious green flag here is that there was an alpha. The alpha provided a functional playable game and the admins responded to the feature recommendations and edits in a timely way. There are players who played in the alpha who were encouraged by the game they saw and evangelized the game based off of the experience they played. That to me is a major green flag. As far as yellow flags, I'm gonna consider the fact that Alanis and Jim Jim have only, between the two of them, played a handful of virtual pet games. I reached out to them to get some information, and Alanis said that she started out playing Dragon Cave, Leiden, House, and then eventually developed a love for Flight Rising, while Jim Jim has only played Neopets. I mean, this is a yellow flag because it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's not like before inventing Neopets or starting Neopets, Adam and Donna had played any other virtual pet games. And I don't think that this is a requirement to have a successful game. It is their first game that they're developing. And like I just said, most of these games are developed by first time developers. So it's not a red flag. It's not a green flag. It's a yellow flag. And this final yellow flag, I was on the fence about even mentioning because I was like, is this worth mentioning? But it's up to you guys. Like I said, it's a yellow flag. It's that the development team, the lead developer, Jim Jim, and the art lead, Alanis, are a married couple. And so you could either see this as a strength or a weakness, right? Like if you ever watch Shark Tank, the sharks aren't necessarily put off by the fact that a husband and wife business team is pitching to them. It's very common. And in my personal experience, I've seen plenty of couples who make great business partners, but I also have a lot of friends who have like gotten divorced and I'm like not even 30. So I see this and I'm like, I don't know whether to count it as like a green flag or a red flag. I think it's a thing that if you're considering donating to the Kickstarter, that it's a good thing to just have in mind if you already have a strong reaction if that's something that triggers something in you, then that's kind of why I'm bringing it up. Now we get to the red flag territory. And I know you guys are like, ooh, there's red flags. But like these red flags are like really lukewarm. They're more like orange flag. The current singular red flag is there's only one developer on the site right now and it's Jim Jim. And Jim Jim does have industry experience. He's capable enough to develop the game as it currently is. This is a concern. So maybe, yeah, maybe it's more of an orange flag is between yellow and red, because if he burns out, if he experiences fatigue, then the game's development will stagnate, or if he's not motivated to work on one part of the site, then it just won't go addressed. And of course, this is all very individual. I haven't interviewed his coworkers or former bosses. I don't know what it's like when it comes to his self-motivation and burnout cycle. The encouraging part of this is that when I reached out to Alanis, she ensured me that they will likely start hiring for additional developer or artist positions once the game outgrows their capabilities. So this is a red flag, but it's not like a permanent one as long as they actually do start hiring once it outgrows their capabilities. I always try to like tell people that project management and asset management, assets being other people, is a skill that needs to be developed. So you don't wanna find yourself in a situation where you really need an extra set of hands, but you don't have the time to get them brought up to speed. You want to hire extra help before you need them, but it's like one of those things where like you need the wisdom to know when that point is. And like I said, I don't know very much about Jim Jim's professional history and perhaps this is already a skill set that he has so that's the singular red flag I just I would hate to see them not bring on any additional set of hands and that this the game development stagnates and we end up with a vanity project cult of personality that only reflects the wishes of the minority I don't I don't like it when a game 
has a lot of potential and doesn't grow because like the people responsible for it don't care about other people's input or don't tap other people to help. Like that sucks. I don't like it when games do that. So, I mean, is it a red flag? It's up to you. I mean, I'm just kind of presenting it as like, this is the highest risk part of the game in my opinion. To do kind of like a Julie's Corner, like hot take on this, I do see this game as having a lot of potential. It's like Flight Rising and Leiden with all the best parts of Flight Rising and all of like the really enjoyable parts of Leiden without like the strenuous everyday requirements of Leiden. And like I said, I will be Kickstarter backing it. I really hope that they reach their stretch goals because I think they deserve it. They've put in a lot of hard work and from everything that I see, it's a really promising project. And I think that the game ecosystem would benefit from Lore Wolf existing. My challenge to the developers would be to try to figure out like some of the Eversky's secret sauce because there's like 10,000 users online at any time on Eversky's. So what is the secret sauce? Is it like trying to tap into like the Warriors fandom, you know, like those cat, <laughs> those cat books? Like there is a very specific audience that is just like wolves. Yeah, that's my stuff. Like that is my thing. And you don't necessarily need that. I didn't care about dragons before I played Flight Rising. And I'm like, you know, I'm kind of a dragon girl because I've been playing Flight Rising for years and I know a lot about dragons. So you don't need to have that information or that love of wolves to enjoy the game, I don't think. It's something that would like come over time. But there's like some secret sauce there. There's some bigger audience. You don't need to draw your cap of how many users online you should expect based off of Flight Rising's numbers, which would be about 2,000, mid 2,000 users online at one time. You know, sometimes at peak traffic, it's 3,000 users online. I would challenge the Lore Wolf team to like dig deep and think, how do we remove barriers and maximize marketability to reach outside of that niche? And I think they've partially done it by making their site so mobile friendly. But there's got there's like a little bit more secret sauce there, I think. And I challenge the Lore Wolf team to find what it is and exploit it a thousand times over. Like maybe reach out to some story time YouTubers that do like little animations and give them space on your homepage. Like, I don't know, like there's, there's something to like really amplifying the support of a niche group of people who thrive on the content that you're providing. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video on Lore Wolf. I haven't done like a Kickstarter new game feature in a really long time. And this is something that I really enjoy about my channel is having the opportunity to see these new games pop up and provide my perspective on them. So let me know in the comments what you think about Lore Wolf and if you will be supporting it come March 1st. Something new that I'm doing with this video is I am releasing a Patreon video concurrently that kind of like talks about like behind the scenes making this video. If you're a Patreon backer, go check it out and let me know what you think.